Hey guys, Armageddon here today with a, another video. It's a video number two in my series on, I guess, reporting the new bill, Bill C-21, that just was announced today for me, yesterday for those guys who are watching this because I'm, I'm doing these videos in the evening and posting them the following morning. So this is video two, there's gonna be five. There's gonna be, the format is an introductory video that kind of prefaces all of this and discusses the format and what I'm talking about. Talks a little bit about the, the bill up front. Three videos to follow that are all the meat and potatoes of the bill. This one is again, the grandfathering provision, as well as leading into the safe storage elements of some of the, some of the things discussed. I'm also gonna talk about the potential airsoft ban, as well as the, the rest of the bill, which was um, municipalities having the ability to enforce bans or other legislation or local legislation on the ownership and use of handguns. Uh, as well as additional red flag laws some and then some other stuff that was smaller like mag limits things like that mag limits aren't changing but they might be doubling down efforts on altering use of mags for different well limits anyways talk about the more later and then finally the final video is going to be kind of closing the thing off and talking about whether or not i think this is actually going to be passed uh the merits on this actually passing because right now this is proposed legislation none of the stuff is in effect right now so don't freak out but it is all has all the potential to pass and become law. So I will talk about that in the final video, close things off. Anyways, guys, let's get into this here now. So, grandfathering. Now, that's gonna be music to most of your ears. Uh, it certainly was to mine. That gave me some hope initially back la well, last May 1st when the ban was announced. By the way, guys, I got married last May 1st. Phenomenal day. I put all this crap behind me and I was just focusing on the day at hand. It was an amazing day. Um, even though the government literally um, tied up and banned more than half the value of all the guns in my inventory. It was wild. Um, six figures and then some. So it was, uh, it was not good. And I was very fortunate that I had done a range day with my then fiance on April 25th or 26th. I got out, did a bunch of videos, a shooting of like about a half dozen guns. All of them were banned on May 1st. So I was super grateful that I at least got out and done that because it allowed me to do you know, the type of content that I normally do for, you know, throughout the summer, I got to at least keep putting out videos. It's kind of gotten to a point now where it's been tricky because I have a lot more guns that I would have done content on that were banned and I haven't been able to take them out and shoot them. So I've been able to sub in a bunch of other stuff, make other provisions, like I'm going to Wolverine Supplies, those are the little patch right over there. Going to those guys in the spring to do some real fun stuff. We're gonna be messing around with some prohibs, doing some good Good video on that. It's gonna let me talk about some really historical guns. I'm pretty pretty excited for that. But look for that um, Q2 and three in my content. Anyways, guys, that's a bit of bit of a tangent. Basically, just trying to communicate the fact that I am right there with you guys in this fight, and the grandfathering provision of this ban was very real to me. So um, that was really nice to hear. And then it kind of disappeared shortly after the announcement of the legislation. It kind of went away, and we kind of wondered is there still gonna be grandfathering? Because I know um, the Bloc Quebecois apologize if, uh, if I'm not pronouncing that correct. I'm just some hick from out west, right? So, um, I, but basically that party was incredibly uh, adamant that there was no option, that the guns were all bought back, they were all returned to the government, they were all destroyed. And they wanted, because again, very sensitive, again, uh, if you're new to gun ownership or not very familiar with the history of gun, gun control in Canada, Obviously there was stuff with the registration of handguns and machine guns way back when, but a lot of the more recent bans, well, not recent, but in the recent history since the late eighties. So the early nineties, there was a lot of bans and that was kind of the status quo and a lot of gun control for a very long time in Canada. And those bans were all a result largely, uh, at least put in, put into motion by a very terrible act that was committed by a piece of garbage subhuman. And, uh, and that was in Quebec and that was horrible. Um, demonstrably, you know, to cry that, that, uh, that, ah, disgusting. Um, <clears throat> but that led to a lot of, a lot more gun control in Canada. And those bans all came with, you know, subsequent grandfathering licenses. The people that had their guns banned, uh, large, and there might've been a few guns initially that were swept up and that were just like the SPAS 12. I don't think it was covered. There was feather light. There was a couple other random guns, FAMAS, that were just outright banned. And I think you've said the cannon but after that, the, the other bands were, they were all covered by things. And the owners at the time, if you had it, 
you received a grandfather license. And as long as you maintained ownership of a gun in that class of firearm that was banned, you could continue to, in most cases, use with authorization to transport to granted by the, the CFO. Um, those were eventually rescinded, I think, in early 2006 or early 2000s. I think they stopped issuing those. Basically, then all those guns became safe queens, but the owners of which could still buy, sell, trade all those guns, and that kept a marketplace for them, albeit a very um, devalued marketplace. But they still, you know, collectors and, and owners could still enjoy the history, the mechanics, that kind of stuff of it. They could enjoy them as safe queens, essentially. So, and there were limited provisions where you can take them out, like take them out to gun shows for demonstration, like for showing them off type thing, like getting other people, you know, informational things about them. Museums could occasionally do demonstrational shoots, which uh, again, but pretty limited and far and few in between. But those were nice, I guess, pr privileges or provisions enjoyed by the people that owned those those uh, guns of that license. Now this license doesn't go nearly that far. This is basically, if you have it, you have the option of keeping it with some new rules, but you can't do any of that old stuff. You can't take it to the range, you can't buy, sell, trade, What's yours is yours, and that's it. Um, but you can keep it. You also can't bequeath it to future generations. Now, with the exception of a few handguns, like pre-46 historical handguns, um, with, if you have through 12.6 with pistols and things like that, you can hand them down to your next of kin if you want to do that. Anyone else with prohibited firearms, prohibited rifles, you can't. It's like when you die and they go into your state, it's either sell them to someone else that has a license or to a business that's able to buy them, or you get them deactivated and then you can hand them down or sell them to anyone without a license because at that point they're just a piece of metal so that's fine and i expect that space that's basically what you're going to be left with through your options here is you could take these things to your grave and if you want to be buried with it that's fine but it's got to be turned into a basically piece of wall art before that happens or sold off to something some at that point in time an entity that has a license to take it so that's the grandfather provision currently discussed, currently on the table, uh, and that'll be what'll be the thing is if, if this legislation gets passed. Now, why are they doing this? Because I know uh, Bloc Quebecois is not gonna be happy about that. I think NDP probably aren't gonna be happy that either. And again, if I'm, what I'm referencing are the political parties in Canada. They're not gonna like this. They wanted an outright ban. They wanted, you know, for their, their base, they just wanted these things taken away and no longer out there. Now, I think that's pretty silly because the other guns that were banned back 25 and 30 years ago, as far as I'm aware, there's no history of any of those ever been used in a crime. Those have all been quietly and peacefully enjoyed by their owners fully legally. So uh, that, that, that's that, right? Um, now, the reason the government, I think, is looking to do this this grandfathering option, you can still take, you still get whatever they offer your, for your guns, I suppose you can you can choose to take that and give your gun, hand your guns over uh, for to be destroyed, or you can keep them. And the reason I think that the government is doing that is partly, now there's been some speculation because obviously different people don't want people to think that the buybacks failed in other places like Australia or more recently New Zealand. Uh, so they're gonna probably debate some of these, these points. But it's argued that of the potentially 240,000, I think was the, the high side number, the high water mark for the number of guns in circulation in New Zealand at the time of the ban that would have been affected by the ban only 61,000 were otherwise modified or turned in. So basically 25%. Now, they I think they reckon, they, they thought there were between 55,000 and 240,000. So obviously there were more than 55,000, there were at least 61,000. But basically, <sighs> definitely not all of them. And as, and as few as 25% were turned in. So they, they basically considered that buyback, mandatory buyback program, a resounding failure. And... That, that is what that is. So they're looking to have learned from that, I think. And by making it optional, you still have to, you know, declare your gun. Because a lot of the guns that got prohibited were non-restricted, which meant that they were not registered by the government. So the government doesn't know about them. Of course, you know about all the AR-15s, all the other restricted guns that were banned. But uh, like such as, for example, my restricted length XCRM down there, which is oh, such a great gun. That was one of the guns I got out with me on right the end of April there. Super glad I did, because that was a very fun video and a fun video series to make. But uh, they know about those guns. They don't know about the non-restricted ones. And as a result, they're relying on the good conscience and the good obedience of Canadians to turn them all in. So uh, I'm sure lots will. I'm sure there are those who will do something else. Um, not that I wanna promote it, but Mike and Canmore is probably gonna 
get a lot more guns. Anyways, um, that's a tidbit for uh, inside joke there. Um, so I think that they're they're doing this as a way to increase compliance. And again, they're looking at the long game. They're looking at okay, the guys that want to keep their guns, they don't want to they don't want to break the law. They don't want to deal with that stress. I know for myself, I'm a very public person. I got to play by everything. You know, I made the decision a long time ago. I got to play everything by the book because I'm way too public and they know who I am. They know where I am. They know what I have. And even a lot of my non-restricted stuff, it's, and that's, you know, I made the decision. I'm doing this partly as a career and partly because I love making the content and I just, I took that one. I'm playing everything by the book. So I think a lot of other guys will feel the pressure as well. And I think that this gives them an easy out. They get to keep their stuff and they get to stay in compliance with the law. Everyone's happy, right? Except for, except for those people that aren't happy that are probably going to be very vocal about it. But, uh, you know, it's, it sucks because it's the easy out, you know? It, it gives them what they want in the long game. They know that this stuff isn't going to be used in crimes. Like, they've got 25, 30 years track record of all the other previous bands and the fact that those guys can still buy and sell and the stuff didn't get used in crimes or get turned up in crime, right? So it's maybe got stolen, but pretty rarely. So it's they know that there's not much they're not giving much up on their end to do this and the gun owners are probably much more likely to play ball they're going to get a lot more of the guns out there right they're not going to get them all but they're going to get a lot more on the books this way so that's why they're doing it now the provisions to do this are going to be that you comply also with their new safe storage laws what those are we don't know i do suspect speculate that it's going to move from a simple locked container to an actual safe or vault. And so basically you can't just have a locking cabinet or a locking drawer or a locking closet or a locking case. It's actually gotta be something legit. Like, I mean, you can make the, the argument that I could use this uh, tool chest if it's properly secured, you know, to the to the space. I can store restricted firearms in there, no problem. I do suspect that brohibs will be treated the same way as restricted. That's how it's typically been in the past for civilian ownership. I don't think there's gonna be two tiers of I don't think, I mean, I'm speculating. I don't think there's gonna be two different levels of, you need, well, you need a safe within a safe to hold a prohib gun versus just one safe to hold a restricted. Uh, they're probably gonna be the same thing, but they're probably just gonna raise that base factor. And honestly, guys, it's probably not gonna be something as wild as that. Like that's a huge safe for Rhino Metals. That thing's wild, it's huge, it's, it's massive, it's heavy, it's very secure. And I built it into the wall, um, partly for aesthetics, partly for security, and partly for just efficiency of this room that I'm working in. So, and, and you know what? I'm glad I did. For me, it makes sense. I do media and marketing for a bunch of companies in the firearm industry, and I also produce a bunch of content on my own, like I'm doing here, just because I enjoy it, and I enjoy being part of the community. And I, having a big safe like that, I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of pretty wild stuff. Um, and... I feel good knowing that it's locked up very tight and hard to access, both for theft and those people that shouldn't access it, just like children, kids, people that visit your house. You want your stuff locked up. Um, I guess so. right now I'm in a transition a bit into the safe storage element of all this and my experience with safe storage and why, honestly, guys, I don't think it's that big of a... Well, no, okay, I, I, I don't like legislation. I'm kind of of that, you know, two-way mentality based on the Constitution and all laws are infringements. But that said, I do strongly agree with the fact that firearms are incredibly, have the potential to be incredibly dangerous if in the, gotten in the wrong hands. And the things that we can totally prevent as a community are the misuse of firearms and the access of firearms by those that shouldn't use them. Obviously, if someone really wants to steal your stuff, you can't really, like, bags get broken into. But you can keep your three-year-old or your six-year-old or your 12-year-old or your, you know, your your child that's maybe struggling with suicidal things or whatever anything like that right you can keep those people you can keep their hands off it because you can maintain very secure storage of your stuff you can also make it very difficult for it to be to be stolen and time typically works against most thieves so if you make your your room multi layers of defense and you build up that thing like it's going to be harder and harder for those guys to get into it and it's going to increase the likelihood that someone else something's going to intervene before they can steal something so that's good um, the other thing is is training. I do think that people should understand how to safely use and operate a firearm. People should be doing stupid stuff with them. I don't necessarily think it should be a law. They should have a massive stick held over your head. I kind of just think that people should be comments like, it's a gun. Like, don't give your your 13 year old niece a 500 Smith and Wesson 
to shoot for the very first time without any prior knowledge of how to shoot that kind of stuff. Like that stuff is just irresponsible. I've seen too many videos of people smoke themselves in the face with a Desert Eagle that they weren't prepared to shoot. And that's horrible for everybody. So I'll make a separate video on how to introduce a person to a firearm and give themselves a really good experience. Cause that's honestly what our community needs. We need to give more people good first experiences, get them into the community, have a good time. I'm definitely going on a tangent here, but that is uh, something I'm pretty passionate about and I make a regular point of doing. I take out my wife's friends, I take out my friends, work friends, get them acquainted with firearms, give them a really good first experience, go through the safety and explain how things work. And they walk away, A, having a bunch of the prior myths and disinformation dispelled. They have a lot more confidence because they have some knowledge. Knowledge defeats fear. And most people are just innately fear for firearms, which is a good thing, but we don't want fear being used as a weapon against the community. So you want to inform people, get them a good experience, get them into the community. It's awesome. So um, <laughs> again, sorry for the tangent. I'm just, uh, that's very important. That's how our community is going to survive the coming generations. So this is always going to be a fight. So and that's, that's how we're going to get through this all. So um, safe storage. It's probably going to be a safe, probably going to be a vault. Or not a vault necessarily, but, but a safe. I mean, you can get into a solid safe for 500 bucks. Like, it's, it's going to raise the barrier to entry, which is unfortunate for those guys that are just getting into it. That kind of sucks. But at the same time, the market's going to intervene. It's going to be smart solutions that are going to meet the criteria that are going to be pretty affordable. So don't let this be the hill you die on. This is, um, I, I think we're going to get through this. So anyways, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. This is way longer than I wanted this one to be, but this was a pretty important one to me and probably the most substantial video that I was going to talk about. So Next up, we have airsoft, and then we have the municipal bans and whatnot on handguns and red flag things. And then finally closing with, do I think this is gonna come to pass? So that's here to come. All these videos are gonna be live basically at the same time. So they're there for you to see. Thanks a ton, guys. If you guys wanna know more, I am on Instagram pretty much daily, right over here at arm.n.gun. Lots of content on there. Check out my other content on here if you like guns, because uh, I talk a lot about the informational, demonstrational, educational, entertaining side of guns. So that's uh, that's normally what my bag is, not this political legislative stuff, but uh, doing what I gotta do, get this information out there for the community. I do apologize if there's anything misstated in what I've said here today. Um, if you guys wanna use the comments below to keep the thing current, resources and more sources and just updates, please use it productively. And uh, if you guys need to get a hold of me for any reason, I do moderate the comments a little bit not too much. This is what I do on the side. My main day job takes a lot of my time as well. Pretty rocked by COVID and uh, it needs a lot of attention to uh, to see it through this this mess. So um, uh, Instagram, my DMs get really backed up as well. I said this in the main video. I'll say it in the rest of them as well. If you guys really need to get me, Patreon, yes, I'm asking you to throw a few bucks to the channel if you want to get through me on Patreon, but I do make sure that uh, people send me a message on Patreon, I do get back to you. So if it is absolutely necessary that you contact me directly, that's how you're going to get me. So thanks to you guys. Links to all those below. And I will catch you in the next one. Arm and gun out.